How's it going, everybody? Too spooky here. And welcome back to the week of 101s. And if you're unsure what the week of 101s is, we recently hit 100,000 subscribers. And because of that, I am going to be uploading a 101 fact video every single day for a whole week. Today is day number three, and today, we are going to be counting down 101 facts about Slipknot. This video was suggested by... J. Elric and Neo Skull King. Thank you both so much for the suggestion. I'm actually a pretty big fan of Slipknot, and I've been planning on making this video regardless for a very long time. So thank you both for finally giving me the reason to do it. But anyways, guys, slap on those masks, and let's jump right into it. Number 1. The band Slipknot officially formed in 1995 in Des Moines, Iowa. Number 2. During the early days of Slipknot, the band went through quite a few lineup changes. For instance, Anders Kols Finney, Greg Welts, Brandon Darner, Josh Bernard, and Donnie Steele were all members of Slipknot before the official lineup. Side note, I'm aware I probably butchered a couple of those names. Anyways, once the official lineup was made, it consisted of Corey Taylor, Mick Thompson, Jim Root, Craig Jones, Sid Wilson, Sean Cran, Chris Fenn, Paul Gray, and Joey Jordison. Number three. However, the original lineup is not the lineup we have currently today due to the unfortunate death of Paul Gray and departure of Joey Jordison. They were, however, replaced with bassist Alessandro Venturella and drummer Jay Weinberg. The remaining seven members are the same. Number four. Back in 1995, the band went through a few different name changes before deciding on Slipknot. They used names such as Pale Ones, Pig System, and Meld. However, eventually Joey suggested they name the band Slipknot after the song they wrote by the same name. And the rest is history. Number 5. Before the official lineup was formed, the band recorded one record called Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat. The recording process for the album reportedly cost $40,000 to make, and they only ended up making 1,000 copies in total. Number 6. Mate Feed Kill Repeat was released on October 31st of 1996, and the sound of the album is much different from what Slipknot would later become. The track listing consisted of the songs Slipknot, Gently, Do Nothing Bitch Slap, Only One, Tattered and Torn, Confessions, some kill and killers are quiet with a hidden bonus track called Dogfish Rising. As of today, the band considers this album a demo because of the major change in sound and band members before the official lineup began. Additionally, none of the band members actually own a copy of it. Number 7. Quite a few of the songs on Mate Feed Kill Repeat were actually reworked or re-recorded on future albums. For the self-titled album, the song Slipknot was recreated into the song Sick, the songs Only One and Tattered and Torn were re-recorded, but with new lyrics. Then for the album Iowa, Gently was re-recorded, and the song Killers Are Quiet was remade into the song Iowa itself. Number 8. In June of 1998, Slipknot publicly signed a $500,000 seven-album record deal with Roadrunner Records. And then in September of that same year, the band traveled to Malibu, California to record their self-titled album, which was being produced by Ross Robinson. Number 9. In regards to Ross Robinson, his goal was to refine Slipknot's sound instead of altering the band's musical direction. And according to the band, he had some weird ways of doing this, such as waking them up randomly to record takes, throwing quite a few things at them including plant pots, and making them run down a mountain that was nearby to get their blood pumping. But I guess you could say all this paid off. Number 10. In December of 1998, the band took a break from recording for Christmas, and while they were on break, Josh Bernard, who was the band's guitarist at the time, decided to leave the band because of some decisions that were made that he wasn't really happy about. Josh had recorded guitar on all of the tracks that were recorded at that point, and the band decided to recruit Jim Root and went back to the studio in February of 1999. And during this month, the band also finished recording the album. And now with the addition of Jim Root, the official lineup of the band was complete. Number 11. The self-titled album was released on June 29th of 1999. And in early 2000, the album was certified platinum, which just happened to be Roadrunner Records' first platinum album. Number 12. 
Slipknot's first ever tour for the self-titled album was participating in Ozfest of 1999, which due to their crazy live show the band quickly grew in popularity, along with some of their songs being played on the radio. Number 13. During Ozfest of 1999, Corey stated he wasn't allowed to talk at all because his voice was under such strain from the tour. He was only allowed to talk while he was on stage and he was instructed to rest his voice and not make a single sound while he wasn't on stage. Number 14. Their song Purity ended up getting the band accused of copyright infringement and because of that the song had to be removed from the album. And the band wasn't allowed to play it live. However, the band ended up winning the case and were allowed to play the song live again. Purity was later added to new and special versions of the self-titled album from then on. Number 15. After extensive touring, the band went back to the studio and then began recording their sophomore album on January 17th of 2001. It would later be titled Iowa, and it was recorded and produced at Sound City and Sound Image Studios in Los Angeles, California, with producer Ross Robinson once again. Number 16. Due to extensive touring and a lack of breaks, a lot of animosity grew between the members, and with the additions of many personal issues each member was dealing with at the time, it was causing a lot of problems during the recording process, such as Corey's alcohol addiction and other members' drug addictions, and because of this, the recording of Iowa is considered the band's darkest and lowest point in their careers. Number 17. Corey has also said in an interview with FHM that in December of 2001, he put a lot of pressure on himself to create his performance on the album. For instance, while recording the vocals for the song Iowa, he was naked, throwing up on himself, and cutting himself with broken glass. Regarding this, Corey said, and I quote, That's where the best stuff comes from. You've got to break yourself down before you can build something great. Number 18! After the recording process was finished and the album was mixed, Iowa was released on August 28th of 2001. Number 19. After touring and supporting Iowa for around a year, the band decided to go on hiatus because of internal conflicts, and at the time everyone was unsure if Slipknot would ever come back together. Number 20. Eventually the band came back together and moved to the mansion in Los Angeles, California in 2003 to begin recording their third album. This time, their producer was Rick Rubin. According to the band, they didn't even begin recording for three whole months, because they still had yet to work out their differences and were all upset with each other. Eventually, one night, they had some beers and patched everything up. And after that, the recording process finally began. Number 21. Apparently, the members were split on their feelings about Rick Rubin, mainly because he was working with multiple bands at once, and because of that he was almost never at the studio. For instance, Corey Taylor stated, We were being charged horrendous amounts of money, and for me, if you're going to produce something, you're fucking there. I don't care who you are. Corey has also stated in regards to Rick that he is overrated and he is overpaid, and I will never work with him again. Number 22. Volume 3, The Subliminal Verses, was eventually finished and was released on May 25th of 2004. Number 23, Corey stated that he was very unhappy with the vocal takes used on that album, and the reason for it was because of his drinking. He stated, I would drink from the moment I got up until the moment I passed out, and everything I did while I was drinking sounded like shit. So he's not very happy with The Subliminal Verses, to say the least. Number 24, while they were touring for the Subliminal Verses, the band recorded 9.0 Live, which ended up being released on November 1st of 2005. Number 25. After touring the Subliminal Verses, the band took another hiatus before coming back to the studio in February of 2008. This time, the band was recording the album in their home state of Iowa because Los Angeles had too many distractions, apparently. The producer for this album was Dave Fortman, and the recording process went from February to June of 2008. Number 26. This was also the first album that each member of the band contributed to the songwriting process, which Joey was quite happy about. Apparently the band also had written 30 songs between all of them. Number 27. Just like with Rick Rubin, the members of the band were split when it came to their opinions on Dave Fortman. For instance, Joey was very happy with him. But Jim said that the whole process was very rushed and that Dave did an awful job getting all nine of them on the same page, which in his opinion was the most important part of making a Slipknot record. Number 28. 
after recording was finished. The album All Hope Is Gone was released on August 20th of 2008, and the album was then certified platinum on August 10th of 2010. Number 29. The band toured All Hope Is Gone from its release until October 31st of 2009 before going on yet another hiatus. Come on, guys. During this time, on September 9th of 2009, Slipknot also released a 10th anniversary edition of their self-titled album. Number 30. During this hiatus, many of the members went on to visit their side projects or create one. However, unfortunately, tragedy struck and on May 24th of 2010, Paul Gray was found dead in his hotel room due to an accidental morphine overdose. At this point, it was uncertain if Slipknot would ever return. Number 31. Eventually, the band decided that Gray would want them to carry on and continue, so to get back into the groove, Slipknot played a few shows across Europe in 2011 before headlining Mayhem Festival in 2012. During these tours, Donnie Steele, who was once a member of Slipknot in the past, was filling in for Gray, but he was hidden from the stage so he couldn't be seen. Out of respect. Number 32. Also on June 17th of 2012, Slipknot released their greatest hits album called Antennas to Hell, and it was also stated during this time that Slipknot had not began working on any new material as of yet. Number 33. On December 12th of 2013, Slipknot announced on their website that Joey Jordison had left the band for personal reasons. However, in June of 2016, the real reason was finally revealed by Joey himself, and he states that he was fired by Slipknot over email. But the reason for this is because the band thought he was on drugs, due to the fact that during his last handful of shows with Slipknot, he had to be carried to his drums and he wasn't able to drum properly. And it turns out this was because he had a disease that he didn't even know about yet that affected his nervous system. He also said he was up to talk about rejoining the band, but no news of anything like this has been reported since. Number 34. On March 1st of 2014, the band began recording a new record at Sunset Studios in Hollywood, California. The recording process lasted from March 1st to July 28th of 2014, and the album was recorded with the addition of new members Jay Weinberg and Alessandro Venturella. Donnie Steele was involved during some of the recording processes, but he declined joining the band to start a family with his wife. This album was also produced by Greg Fiddleman and Slipknot themselves. Number 35? This album would later be named Point Five, The Grey Chapter, and was released on October 17th of 2014 and October 21st worldwide. Number 36. The band are still touring this album to this very day, and there has been no news about any future albums or plans for the band currently. Number 37. Each member of the band's official lineup dons a number to symbolize the nine members in the band. Zero is Sid Wilson. One is Joey Jordison. Two is Paul Gray. Three is Chris Fenn. Four is Jim Root. Five is Craig Jones. Six is Sean Cran. Seven is Mick Thompson. And eight is Corey Taylor. Number 38. The music video for Duality reportedly cost the record company around $500,000 to create. And one of, if not the biggest expense, was paying the family of the house that was destroyed in Des Moines, Iowa $50,000 for the damages. Now you'd think that Roadrunner would be pretty upset about having to dish out so much money, but Roadrunner have actually listed Duality as the best music video in Roadrunner history, so it seems they're quite proud of it. Number 39. The nose on Chris Fenn's mask is around 7 to 8 inches long. Number 40. In the beginning of the song Sick, we hear the phrase, HERE COMES THE PAIN! Well, it turns out this was taken from Al Pacino's character in the movie, Carlito's Way. Number 41. Before the band had their mask designs set in place, and their jumpsuits as well, a few of the members tried a couple different costume ideas, such as Cory dressing up as a priest. Number 42. The two newest members of Slipknot were originally given an opportunity to create their own masks, but apparently they weren't in the Slipknot mindset quite yet, and what they came up with was a little too cartoony. So instead, the band gave them their masks and told them that this is what they get for now, and they can hopefully figure it out the rest of the way. Number 43. The song AOV stands for Approaching Original Violence, and the song itself is about looking at each other and dealing with a lot of the issues that we've had, yet trying to bury the hatchet so we can get back on our feet. Because you cannot act as one if you have an issue with each other, and you have to be on the same page to move forward. Number 44. 
A while ago, Slipknot were doing an in-store signing somewhere and were running a little bit late. So they decided to change into their uniforms in the van. Well, once they arrived and they all got out of the van, each wearing their masks, nearby police thought that they were about to perform some sort of heist and yelled at them to get on the ground. Although the situation soon became de-escalated as they realized there was no threat. Number 45. Slipknot wanted to burn camel feces at Knotfest in California, but California's fire department forbid them because they said the smell would be a public nuisance, so in the end, they just weren't allowed. Number 46. There was a supposed second album or demo that was supposed to surface after Mate Feed Kill Repeat called Crows, or at the very least, that is the supposed name. However, the recordings were scrapped and it never saw the light of day. The tracklist would have been Slipknot Gently, together as one song, Me Inside, do Nothing Bitch Slap, Coleslaw, Only One, Prosthetics, Carve, Tattered and Torn, Windows, Interloper, and Scissors. And although it was never released, you can still find a lot of these songs on YouTube. Whether or not they are actually legitimate is up for debate. Number 47. The beeping sound at the end of the song, Before I Forget, is actually Morse code, which spells out the word Slipknot. Number 48. The song Custer is a reference to Custer's Last Stand, which was a battle that took place during the Civil War where George Armstrong Custer suffered huge defeat to Indian warriors. It applies to Slipknot in the fact that they are charging into their last stand, and just when you think they're done and they're gone, they're going to come back full force and rewrite history. Number 49. The song 515 is actually another nod to Iowa, because 515 is the area code for Central Iowa, which is where Des Moines is located. This song is also the opening song to the album Iowa. Number 50. Everything Ends is about the time Corey tried to commit suicide, and the first day he figured out what life was all about. Specifically about the last day in a life he doesn't want to remember, and about the first day in life that he is living right now. Number 51. Gematria, the killing name, is a song about Corey's disgust for America, but more about its people. Of course, not about everyone. He has quite the love and respect for his country, the people who serve to protect it, and the people who exercise their right to disagree. But to him, there are so many more that are corrupt, and that's who the song is for. Number 52. Slipknot calls their fans maggots. Because from the stage, it looks like a ton of maggots were just jumping around and falling all over each other. Now, while researching this video, I noticed that a lot of sources say that Joey was the one who dubbed the term maggots for their fans. But in an interview with Sean Pran, he claimed that he was the one that dubbed the name. And he came up with it after filming a dead deer and watching the maggots feeding on it mashed together like a bunch of kids in a crowd. Number 53. The song Goodbye is about the day Paul Gray passed away, and the grief that came along with it. Number 54. The song Butcher's Hook is about the record industry, but specifically the emo bands involved. Number 55. Corey has stated that the song Eeyore is about the dick in the pit, particularly a tall blonde guy that frequently attended shows, and roughed people up in the pit whom they called Thor. Well, one day the pit turned on him and roughed him up instead, and that's what the song is about. Number 56. Like I stated earlier, the song Iowa is a reworking of the previous song Killers Are Quiet from Mate Feed Kill Repeat. Well, that song and Iowa are about someone who kills women and recreates them in his own image, like a living doll. Number 57. The song Pulse of the Maggots is about how Slipknot will always be there for its fans no matter what. Specifically about how the band came back together even after the hiatus that took place after touring the album Iowa. Many fans were unsure if Slipknot would ever regroup and make a new album. But this song is basically saying, don't worry, even if we go away for a while, we'll be back. Number 58. The song Disaster Peace is about a bully who used to pick on Corey. And in this song, he finally just snaps and sings about the desire he has to kill the bully who caused him so much pain and anguish. Number 59. The song Wait and Bleed is about a man who keeps having these repetitive black and white dreams about lying in a bathtub which is full of his own blood. And when he looks over, his wrists are slit. Well, one day he wakes up and sees that his dream became a reality, but he doesn't want to believe it's true, so he tries to fall back asleep again, but he ends up dying instead. Number 60, Spit It Out, is about a few specific people at a local radio station in Des Moines who would talk crap about the band and purposely keep them off the air, and tried to convince other radio stations to do the same, essentially slandering them. 
Number 61. So after Slipknot had done a fair share of meet and greets, Clown started wearing surgical gloves to them. Mainly just because he would see the people in line who would be rubbing their nose the whole time or people who just looked and smelled very dirty. So he eventually decided he didn't want to risk catching something and be a little bit safer. The other members thought he was being a dick at first. However, one time after a meet and greet was over, Clown showed the rest of the band his glove afterwards, and it was black. And not just a little bit dirty either, I'm talking pitch black. Number 62. The Devil and I is about the internal struggle we all deal with. Basically a battle between ourself to outrule negativity, guilt, and to not let yourself defeat yourself. Number 63. The name of the song, 742-617-000027, may seem like just a bunch of random numbers, but it actually has meaning behind it. It was the shipping code on their album, Mate Feed Kill Repeat, and now each member of the band wears that number on their jumpsuit. Number 64. According to Clown, the weirdest thing he ever had to sign was a human femur. Although Clown chose not to name the person or the country they were from, but apparently this girl dropped the femur down in front of him at a signing and it had the words, people equal shit written on it. Clown also said that it looked as though it was freshly dug from a grave. He has also stated that he had quite a long talk with this girl afterwards and they got everything settled. Number 65. The Heretic Anthem is a song about the record labels who turned Slipknot away and the labels who showed no interest in them. Number 66. Greg Welts, who was previously a member of Slipknot, would wear a baby mask on stage, and he was infamously known as Cuddles. Number 67. The lyrics of Before I Forget are about the evolution and nature of man and where that leaves us now. Number 68. Dead Memories is about feelings and memories Corey was holding in for the past 10 years, and this song is his way of letting them go. Number 69. The first verse and chorus of the song Circle was actually written and recorded during the Iowa tour, and that very same take was added to the final product of the song. Number 70. The band knew they wanted the title of their fifth album, Point Five, The Grey Chapter, to somehow include Paul Gray's name. But they just didn't know how to find the right phrase, so Corey and Clown sat in a call for hours bouncing ideas for a title track back and forth until they finally found the one that just felt right. And that, as you can guess, was the Grey Chapter. Number 71. The song Prosthetics was inspired by the 1965 movie The Collector, which is about a butterfly collector who decided to collect humans as well. Number 72. During the first show of the Mayhem Tour, Sid ended up breaking both of his heels right at the beginning, and he still managed to play the whole set, but I guess he had trouble because he was in so much pain, and afterwards he played the rest of the tour in a wheelchair. Number 73. The song Jahina deals with obsession, but from the person with the obsession's point of view, and that person wanting to let go of the facade they're in and start being true to their self. Number 74. Many of the lyrics from the album Mate Feed Kill Repeat were based off of a role-playing game called Werewolf the Apocalypse. Number 75. The guitar riff on Before I Forget is actually just a reworking of a riff back from the band's song Carve off of the unreleased Crows album. Number 76. There have been two different murder cases that were linked to Slipknot, or blamed on Slipknot, I guess. The first was on May 23rd of 2003, where Jason Harris and Amber Riley killed their friend Tara Ray Taylor, but they did it while saying words to Slipknot's song, Disaster Piece. The second incident happened back in 2008 when a kid in South Africa went to school wearing a Slipknot mask and killed someone with a sword. In regards to this, Corey Taylor has said, At the end of the day, there are always going to be mental disorders and people who cause violence for no other reason than the fact that they're fucked up and lost. Number 77. The screams on the song 515 were actually done by Sid Wilson. Apparently, he came into the studio when he wasn't even supposed to be there, and he just needed to scream. His grandfather had actually passed away the night before, unfortunately, which is why he wasn't supposed to be there in the first place. But he just needed to vent his emotions by screaming. So they handed him a mic, and he just let it all out. Apparently, he was also crying and screaming so much he ended up falling more and more out of time. And a lot of these screams are present on 515. Number 78. The lyrics for the song Scissors were written by Joey Jordison. However, the words and screaming at the end of the song were all improvised by Corey while he was singing the vocals in the studio. Number 79. Apparently, the dreads from Corey's mask was his own hair. I guess early on he had dreads and he would just feed it through the top. However, he eventually ripped out these dreads and attached them to his mask to make it easier, which in turn ended up giving him a scalp infection. 
Number 80. In the song Deluded, there is a small sample where a man says, I don't have time for the living. This sample was taken from the movie Cemetery Man. Number 81. The subliminal verses doesn't feature any cursing other than the words bitch and bastard because critics in the past critiqued Corey's lyrics saying that he relies too much on the profanity. So he tried to take a step back and prove to them that he could do without them. Number 82. Corey wrote the song Left Behind about the friends he made during a period of time where he was homeless and sleeping under a bridge in Des Moines. Number 83. At one point in England, one of the members who he will not name had a weird threesome on the floor of a shower area with two girls who were pissing on them, and the whole band and crew were there to watch. Okay then. Number 84. Be Prepared for Hell was written by Clown, and he also sings the whole song, although the lyrics in the song are very short. Number 85. Corey used to work at a porn shop in Des Moines, and apparently one day, Clown, Joey, and Mick all came in and basically told him he's joining Slipknot or they're going to beat the shit out of him. So he joined. Number 86. Clown is the one responsible for the band's initial image, and he is also the member in charge of the band's art, creative imagery, and photography. Number 87. The spikes on Craig's mask are over 12 inches long and reportedly aren't made of rubber like most people think. Number 88. Sid is the youngest member of the band out of all the original members. Number 89. Every single song on the Grey chapter had lyrics that were inspired by Paul Gray's death in one way or another. Whether it was a direct message to him or the members dealing with their grief, each song was inspired by him. Number 90. The self-titled album is still the best-selling album out of all the band's albums to this day. Number 91. The quote, you can't see California without Marlon Brando's eyes from the song Eyeless came from a homeless guy Corey walked past on the street in California. Apparently the homeless man kept saying the quote over and over. Number 92. Sometimes during shows, Sib would light himself on fire. Well, one time it got out of control and he suffered third degree burns to his legs. Needless to say, he didn't do it too often after that. Number 93. Snuff basically tells a story about how the protagonist's soul is too dark to let any love in, pushing the person they love and everyone else away in the process. Corey wrote it about a person who helped him through a lot of stuff, and Corey developed feelings for that person and thought they felt the same. But unfortunately, they didn't. Number 94. Now I know earlier we stated that the weirdest thing Clown was ever asked to sign was a human femur, but the second weirdest thing was a cow's heart. Apparently this girl came up to him, hit him in the back of the head, and then pulled out the heart and asked him to sign it. Number 95! The date, September 9th, 2009, is abbreviated as 090909, and this was also the date of the 10th anniversary edition of the self-titled album being released. And the specific date was supposed to symbolize the fact that all nine members from the self-titled album were still in the band, and that they've overcome all their obstacles to get to where they are now. Number 96! Duality is about being true to yourself, mainly not letting anyone rule you or what you do, except for yourself. Number 97. I'm not sure if the band still do this to this day, but when the band used to go on tour, they wouldn't wash their masks until the tour was over. They claimed they did this to bring the tour spirit with them, and these masks would be littered with sweat, spit, and even vomit. Number 98. At every Slipknot show when the band plays Spit It Out, they instruct everyone to get down on the ground, and when they sing the lyrics, jump the fuck up, everyone is supposed to leap off the ground and just go crazy. It's a really cool experience if you haven't been to a Slipknot show yet, and if you haven't, well what the hell are you doing with your life? Number 99. The cover photo of the self-titled album was actually taken in Clown's parents' garage. Number 100. Vermilion is about a stalker stalking a woman. And then in Vermilion Part 2, it is revealed that the woman wasn't real all along. And the moment that you've all been waiting for... Number 101. So for quite a while, Clown kept this dead decaying bird in a jar, and took it around on tour. And at the beginning of the shows, the band members would open up the jar and smell it, to get themselves riled up for the show. Apparently the smell was so bad that it would make some of them throw up immediately, and over time it started getting this weird goopy liquid all over it. Well, at one particular show they had the bird on stage and were huffing it, and the fans down in the front were yelling at the band to let them smell it. So they held the jar up to them and apparently some of them not only smelled it, but also reached in and grabbed out the weird liquid and started eating it. So moral of this fact, the Slipknot fans are crazier than the band members themselves. 
But there you have it everybody, 101 facts about the band Slipknot. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this video today and hopefully you learned something. If you did, make sure to drop a like on this video. But that is not all. If you leave a like on this video, there is a point. 00076263 chance that you will receive your very own authentic Slipknot mask. That is correct. The chances are very slim, but if you are one of the lucky few, it will appear on your head in the next 12 days. But don't get your hopes up. Also, make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. We've got four more videos left in the week of 101s, and not only that, we've got plenty more music fact videos in the future on the way. And I would just appreciate the fuck out of you if you subscribed anyways. Also, make sure to comment down below which band you want me to do a facts video about next. Wait, whoa. Hang on a second. Where the fuck is Towley? Hang on a second, let me call him here. God fucking Towel, I swear. Hello? Towley, where the fuck are you? You're supposed to be here right now. We're filming the video. Wait, whoa, hang on a second. Hang on a second. I thought you said I was supposed to be there at 5 p.m. Towley, it is 5 p.m. Oh, are you fucking serious? I thought it was 5 a.m. Holy shit. I'm sorry, man. I'm just so fucking high. I don't even know what's going on. <sighs> you know what, Towley? Just forget it. Just be here tomorrow, all right? If you're not, there's going to be a serious problem, okay? Okay, man. I'm sorry, y'all. I'll make sure that I'm all cleaned up. I'll be there tomorrow. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye. I really wish Bane and Carl were here right now. Well, it looks like I made it. I'd better hurry to the area of the wall that Carl climbed over. Maybe he's still hanging around there. Hmm. Huh. I guess I should ask around and see if anyone has seen him. Uh, excuse me, sir. Have you seen that red-headed kid who climbed over the Great Wall? Fuck off, dude! Uh, excuse me. Have you seen that red-headed kid who climbed over the Great Wall? No. Uh, excuse me. Have you seen that goddamn red-headed kid who climbed over the Great Wall? You just asked me. Jesus fucking Christ. These people are fucking dicks. Oh, wait. A restaurant. Maybe Carl came in here. I should probably go ask. Mugiwara Nakama? Uh, yes, hello. I was wondering if you could tell me if you've seen a red-headed waste of life around here anywhere. Ah, not in English, eh? Ah, uh, yes, hello, sir. How can I take your order? Uh, no, thank you, actually. I was wondering if you could tell me if you have- Oh, no, no. No order, no info, son. Run along now. Uh, what did you just say to me? I said run along. All right, man, I'm gonna level with you here. I'm going to give you five seconds to cut the shit, or I will pick you up and throw you across the goddamn room. Oh, okay, okay, me understand. Me understand. Let me take it back and tell you to get the fuck out of my restaurant! <laughs> oh. Listen up, old man. I will literally rip your spine out of your mouth if you don't quit being a fucking asshole and answer my question. Okay, okay. I'm so sorry, so sorry, sir. Please don't hurt me anymore. You just ask your question and get out of my store, please. Good answer. Now my question is, have you seen the red-headed kid who climbed over the Great Wall? Well, uh... A red-headed kid came in here yesterday around this time. But I don't know if he climbed Great Wall. Huh, that might be Carl. Did he say where he was going? He did ask for directions to Mount Tri. And he no pay for his food. Mount Tai, huh? Well, how do I get there? You go southwest for about 20 miles and it's the one on the rift. Thank you, old man. Now was that so hard? Yes, now get the fuck out of my store before I grab my gun. Ah, such hospitality. I'll be on my way now. <laughs> Just wait till he find out I gave him wrong direction and took his wallet. Um, hello? Um, hello? Is anyone there? Is anyone there? Wow, this place is huge. Who dares enter my laboratory? No, please, don't shoot, it's Carl! We, we, we talked on that message board about my memory loss a few days ago, remember? Oh, Carl, my boy, I didn't think you'd actually be coming. And why is that? 
Well, you said just now that you talked to me only a few days ago. And, well, I hate to burst your bubble, but we haven't spoken for a few weeks now. You told me you'd be flying out to China in three days, and, well, it's been way more than three days. Jeez, is that long, huh? I must have lost way more memory than I thought. Well, hopefully we can figure out what went wrong and restore all of your lost memories. How about you come into the next room with me and we'll get started? Sure, mister, uh... You know, I don't believe I actually caught your name. Ah, well, my name is Vegapunk. Well, it's nice to meet you, Vegapunk. You as well, Carl. Now, shall we? Yeah, sure. Well, alright, Carl. Start from the night you spoke with me and everything you remember since then. Okay, well, I was talking with you about how I lost my memories from a few days prior, and you were saying how you created an experimental memory retriever machine thingy, and that you would be able to restore my memories for some cash. Uh, let me stop you right there. I forgot to ask before, how exactly did you lose your memory in the first place? Did you hit your head? No, actually my brain exploded from a very lit fact. The knowledge was so fire that my brain went into information overload and ended up exploding which apparently killed me in the process. I gotta tell you, that fact was pretty lit, fam. Wait, wait, hold up. What exactly was this fact? Um, I, I don't remember the details. I can link you the video later, though. Oh, okay, that'd be cool. Wait, wait, hold up. You died? How in the world did you come back to life? You know, I'm not so sure. I just kind of woke up and I was healed up and everything. But I also couldn't remember a thing from the day before I died, which just happened to be the best day of my life, apparently. So I really, really need my memories back for that one. Ah, oh, well this is a very peculiar case, if I do say so myself. Not only have I never heard of someone coming back from the dead with such specific memory loss, but I've also never heard of someone whose injuries were completely healed like that. I'll need to run a lot of tests. Anyways, continue, what happened next? Okay, well after talking to you I went to bed, then I woke up, bought a ticket, and packed. Also helped too spooky with a script, I believe. Went back to sleep and... the next thing I know I'm waking up covered in blood at the bottom of a cave that is apparently on an island, and I had no idea how the hell I got down there. I cleaned up in a nearby puddle and uh, navigated the cave until I came across a light, which turned out to belong to George Bush. He threatened me with a gun, and then some weird guy with blue hair ran in, screaming ow and super all the time. Honestly, he sounded like a complete idiot. Hmm, that kind of sounds like Frankie. No, it, it couldn't be. This kid's story is so far-fetched, I'm starting to think that he's actually just mentally ill. So, the blue idiot starts yelling ow and shit at the former president, and then they both just started throwing punches! So I took that opportunity to dip out before they noticed I was gone, and as I was running I heard some incoherent yelling followed by a huge explosion. And all of a sudden the cave just started shaking like your parents' bed on garage sale day. And the next thing I know, a huge wave of fire is coming at me. I remember the pain when it hit me too. Man, that was something else. And that's the last thing I remember before I blacked out. Then I'm waking up covered in burns on a ship in the middle of the ocean. I set the ship's autopilot for China and took a shower, and all the burns just went away like they were nothing. Then this gigantic sea monster popped out of the sea and asked me to give it a clever way to kill itself, or it would kill me. So I thought about it and told him to go suffocate himself in space. So he jumped up into space, and apparently the boat got caught on him when he did, so we got knocked off course for a while. So then I played old school RuneScape and laid around until we arrived in China, and well... Then I climbed over the Great Wall, got some directions, and well, here I am! You, uh, you're... you're kidding, right? There's no way that all could have happened. I'm dead serious, Vegapunk. Okay, well, in that case I'm going to have to ask you to get the fuck out. Hopefully everything's well on their end. Anyways guys, if you could not get enough too spooky content, well why don't you click here? For 101 facts about Pokemon, which was actually the previous video in the week of 101s. And if that's not doing it for you, well why don't you click here for 101 facts about Pantera. However, since that Pantera video is pretty old, I'm going to be giving you guys a third option today, which is 50 facts about Nirvana. Anyways guys, thank you so much for watching this video today, I really do appreciate it. These music related videos do not get near as many views as my other videos. 
so it means a lot to me that you guys would check it out. Anyways guys, thank you for watching once again, and I will see you tomorrow with a new video.